Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, so I view this as a very important retreat to uh, come up with some really important ideas as we move forward. And so I'm going to be here most of the day. I'm very interested to hear what our scientists uh, have to say. Let me uh, start out by asking you, you know, how many of you want to develop better ways to prevent, treat uh, y human cancer? Okay, good, everybody. I was hoping everybody would raise their hand. Because we, you have a lot of work to do. You know, for the most part, the treatment of cancer stinks. Um, and I'll give you some personal examples. Uh, two nights ago, a very close aunt of mine uh, passed away here at Mount Sinai. Uh, she w was uh, a very vibrant, incredible woman. Uh, she was like a sister to me, 77 years old, had smoked for about 20 years and then stopped smoking and hadn't smoked for 20 years after that. And then in November of 2017, she started having respiratory symptoms and was di uh, diagnosed uh, with lung cancer that was already metastatic. She got great care here at Mount Sinai. Uh, she, she loved the doctors here, she loved the nurses, she loved the social workers, uh, but none of the treatments worked. She got immunotherapy, she got standard chemotherapy, uh, uh, radiation uh, treatment, but nothing worked. Uh, then I have a, a friend, very close friend, one of my very best friends has metastatic prostate cancer. Uh, he's getting treatment also here at Mount Sinai, getting great uh, treatment, but it's metastatic. And while the, the time course of metastatic prostate disease can be a lot slower, it's not curable. He knows that. And, you know, the treatment is not great. You know, you get treatment to reduce testosterone, you get tired, you get weak. It really affects uh, your lifestyle. And then, as many of you know, uh, we lost you know, one of the giants of Mount Sinai a number of months ago, uh, Pamela Sklar, uh, to metastatic breast cancer. She fought uh, courageously. Uh, she, again, got, you know, great care here and uh, in the city, and she lost. So, you know, we're not there yet. And, you know, the question for us at Mount Sinai is that if we don't do it, who's going to do it? And if we're not going to do it now, when is it going to happen? So, you know, my position as dean is that I want all of you to either individually or as teams to not only get grants, which you have to do or publish in top papers, but that you've got to discover new treatments for cancer. You know, at the end of the day, and when your career is over, your legacy um, is not going to be how many papers you published. It's going to be who did you help. So I promise you that we will provide the resources for you to do that, but you're going to need the imagination, the passion, the dedication uh, to get it done. So I hope you know this uh, this conference today, this retreat, uh, assist in that mission, and I'm here to help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. So before uh, before we get started, um, uh, the uh, just want a few sort of high-level comments about uh, uh, cancer here at Mount Sinai, and that is, I think we are in a wonderful position right now to make the strides that Dean Charney was just uh, talking about to improve care uh, and treatments and also prevention, um, and that's in large part because of this amazing wave of new technologies uh, and new insights in biology uh, that are really transforming what's going on. Um, uh, at you know here at Mount Sinai and at an international level, so let me let me get started. So I'm going to give you some slides for those of you who are not members of the Tisch Cancer Institute. This is sort of a you know interaction um, with uh, uh, the Genetics and Genome Sciences Department and the Icon Institute and the uh, Tisch Cancer Institute. Now, and this is an informational slide to try to give you a sense of what the Tisch Cancer Institute is. And, uh, and what we're, what we're doing. Uh, this is uh, just basically we're an NCI-designated cancer center. Uh, 
We, are, we have four different disease programs that are NCI uh, approved. You can see them there, including uh, cancer immunology, cancer mechanisms, liver cancer, and cancer prevention and control. Oh, sorry. Um, and um, we have, we're very focused on uh, clinical trials here. So you can see the clinical trial uh, enrollment. Um, and uh, and uh, it, it's quite uh, nice. The number of trials is, uh, is growing. We want to grow these numbers. Uh, and also, if you see, we have uh, shared resources uh, that are up there that are here to help um, uh, advance the science and the scientific mission. Um, the uh, TCI members come from 22 different departments and 15 different institutes. We have 153 members. Uh, and we have a total grant funding of $93 million. The idea of the institute is to embrace all departments and other institutes in a collaborative manner, uh, try to break down silos and, and, and generate interactions. Uh, membership is defined uh, relatively, uh, rather rigorously. Basically, you have to have um, uh, um, peer-reviewed funding or be leading investigator-initiated trial. There's some other uh, membership um, uh, types as well uh, that I won't get into. but. Um, Basically, that's what is driving the full membership uh, for our center. Um, so, uh, oops. So basically, in the strategic plan, um, we have, uh, uh, you can see, we're trying to improve resources. And with uh, Dennis's help and, and the help of, of a lot of people here in the audience, we've been working on trying to improve the resources here that are available to you to uh, accomplish your goals. And, um, and, 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 and we've, basically done this for, from a bootstrap approach, talking to different investigators on campus, trying to identify what are the uh, rate limiting barriers uh, for, uh, for, uh, for uh, getting uh, um, research done here. And th these, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but uh, and these slides are gonna be made public, but these are some of the different ideas that we're working on. Uh, where are we? We're uh, in the, uh, uh, on East Harlem, actually. That's where our site is. Uh, uh, for at Mount Sinai, and um, and this is the local environment. You can see uh, we have uh, increased uh, cancer mortality. Or no, this is cancer incidence um, uh, in a variety of different uh, common malignancies in our uh, immediate environment, and we also have uh, uh, evidence of uh, increased risk factors um, here in our in our community as well. Uh, these things are things we need to address to actually have an improvement here locally. One of the other things is our cancer mortality rates uh, have a big disparity between East Harlem and Central Harlem versus the rest of New York City and uh, the Upper East Side. Uh, and um, you can also see um, the, the poverty rates um, are also uh, different. Um, one of the things that's uh, uh, very exciting about Mount Sinai is we are uh, treating more and more patients. And this is just an example of the increased uh, patient visits. Um, uh, in ambulatory oncology, and you can see last year we increased the by 6%. Um, we also have um, institutional commitments as part of the strategic plan uh, in cancer in immunotherapies, the Immunology Institute, novel therapeutics, cancer prevention and control. So these are all uh, really exciting initiatives that are going to help us become a comprehensive cancer center. Uh, and um, uh, in, in addition, uh, this, this we have um, very high priority faculty recruitment. I'm not going to go through this whole slide, but just to say that uh, we want to improve cancer IT and data management um, for cancer. And also, we're going to be co-recruiting with Adam uh, in computational biology and, and genome technology for cancer. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, the, um, one of the things that the Tisch Cancer Institute uh, prides itself in is promoting collaborations. And we do this um, with using uh, pilot projects. And here's some examples of the kinds of pilot projects we're doing. Um, these are often uh, recommended to us by our external advisory board to try to cement interactions across programs, identify areas where we could do better. Uh, and um, we also have organized the seminar series. Um, and um, we're emphasizing our recruitment in disease-oriented areas um, where we can have multidisciplinary approaches around them. Uh, the, uh, I'm particularly uh, proud of the, the seminar series that we put together on Fridays, uh, which is focused on clinical trial science. Uh, it's Fridays at noon, and we're um, uh, and you're all invited to attend that. Um, so, uh, last, I need uh, like to introduce Adam. So, um, it's really exciting that Adam Argolan has decided to come here and and uh, work with us and build. He's, as you know, the uh, uh, now been appointed uh, chair of uh, 
Genetics and the Genome Sciences Department and the Icon Institute for Genomics and Multiscale Biology. Um, he has a really uh, wonderful background in, in uh, computational um, uh, informatics and computational biology. Uh, as a, um, uh, his, his background was a, uh, got a master's in computer science at, at Penn. He uh, went on to get his PhD uh, with Andrea Califano at Columbia, where he developed a like an amazing algorithm um, uh, uh, for uh, data analysis and gene expression analysis that's been like really uh, used like phenomenally uh, and still being used to, uh, to this day. Uh, at the time, it, uh, Google stated it was the second most influential computational biology algorithm in the last decade. And then um, as a postdoc at the Broad, he uh, tried to use computational biology biology to, to define uh, new drug combinations for treatment that would be predictive using the cancer cell line encyclopedia. And um, he later uh, moved into industry as the director of computational biology at SAGE Bionetworks, and then moved from there to Oregon Health Sciences University and also the Knight Cancer Center, um, which, which he built a thriving uh, computational biology program, raising over $30 million and, and recruiting many faculty. Um, uh, one of the things I think it was really a great highlight about Adam, in addition to his many papers and uh, seminal contributions, is, is that he's a team scientist. He works collaboratively. He's very proud that uh, nearly all of his grants are, um, if not all of them, are uh, collaborative. Uh, he has um, been awarded 28 grants, uh, that's, uh, uh, which are, um, are almost always uh, multiple PIs. And, and that's an amazing accomplishment. Anyway, Adam, you know, we're uh, so excited that you're here, and I'm really glad we had this opportunity to have this uh, retreat where we can identify uh, ways to work together better and also transmit information across the institutes and departments. And I think uh, this is a, a wonderful starting place. So uh, welcome, and um, thanks, thanks for coming. Thank you very much, Ramon. Um, it's great to be here. I've um, been uh, about two months now on the job, and I've had the opportunity to learn about so much amazing science going on from all the people in this room. And I hope that after we all hear about this science today, we'll come to think, as I do, that if we take Dean Charney on his charge from this morning to chart bold new directions in, in cancer research, and we do that in a way that fully integrates the advancements that's being made here in uh, data science, technology development, and all areas of cancer research. We really have the opportunity, the potential here to discover and deliver to patients breakthrough treatments faster than have ever been possible. Today we'll uh, hear about many of the key areas that we'd like to build on that I think will make this vision possible. We'll hear about massive um, data sets that will fuel our discoveries, um, including data resources and biospecimens collected from around the health system that are diverse in ethnicity, different diseases, longitudinal history of disease, and we'll hear about even much larger data sets that can be amassed from public data sources and through our unique partnership with uh, Semaphore. We'll hear about people who have world-class expertise in how to interpret these complex data sets. Uh, including to understand the key molecular drivers of disease and to stratify different subtypes into treatment response based on information from genetics, pathology, and immunology. We'll hear also from people who are breaking new ground in how we profile uh, new aspects of uh, tumor biology, including rich information about the immune microenvironment and the microbiome, and people who are increasing the resolution of these measurements to the single cell. We'll hear also about people who are working on new functional technologies who can take all of the insights that are derived from these new profiling technologies and our analytics and rapidly test what drugs 
uh, are likely to be effective. And finally, we'll see illustrations that I think um, demonstrate what can be our greatest strength here, and that's the ability to work across an integrated health system with speed and agility to bring all of these pieces together, bring together big data, advanced analytics, genome technologies to rapidly test insights and working with disease experts across all different areas of cancer to quickly bring these discoveries close to patients, closer to patients. And we'll show some, some examples of this, um, how we've actually, uh, scientists here have treated uh, breast cancer based on insights from integrating uh, network modeling with functional screens and people who've treated multiple myeloma based on new drugs that are discovered from uh, gene expression profiles and uh, demonstrated a response in the vast majority of patients that they predicted new treatments for. And we'll hear about how we're developing personalized vaccines by combining uh, computational predictions with uh, new tumor immunology insights that are specific to each patient. So I think if we are able to put these pieces together, this is our real challenge, if we can put these pieces together and integrate big data with advanced analytics to predict new therapies, new breakthroughs in genome technology to better characterize uh, each individual tumor and bring the insights from data rapidly into testing of drug e efficacy and work closely with disease experts across campus to bring those insights closer to patients. If we can do all that, I think going forward we really can discover and deliver treatments faster than has ever been possible. So how are we going to do that specifically? Well, that's actually going to be up to us all. Uh, this is a process that starts today, and today we uh, officially have a charge to move forward on this, um, starting with learning what's going on, and after this we'll all work together to figure out specifically what directions we want to take to make this vision possible. What I hope to do is create uh, an ecosystem here that can drive this cycle of innovation, big data, advanced analytics to make predictions, new technologies to rapidly test predictions and bringing those to very closely to patients quickly. Um, I'd like to try to drive us working together in this kind of cycle in order to uh, integrate all of the work across different expertises here, use this to make bigger, faster discoveries, make impact to patients faster, bigger impact to patients, but importantly, not just make impacts collectively, but have each person be able to make their own contributions, their own uh, area of innovation and expertise reach scientific impact much bigger and faster by being able to work in this ecosystem that leverages the work of all of these other supporting pieces. So that's what I hope to be able to help with here. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about what's important to me, what I think about uh, in terms of, you know, what we prioritize when we design these types of new programs. And I think of, I describe these in terms of what I call core values. Uh, these are the, the things that um, guide all of my thought process pretty much when we're thinking about new directions, new, new types of programs. They're also things that people can uh, call me out on if, you know, I'm not uh, aligning with them. Sometimes, most importantly, call me out on number one. This always, if somebody ever says, we're doing something and is this really good for the patient that has to override everything else and we have to make that the top priority. Uh, second, I think a lot about simplifying. Um, if we take a step back, we're potentially in a bit of a crisis in terms of the uh, 
uh, some, a lot of the, the science that, that's published, you know, reports are that 11%, 11% of the landmark uh, papers in cancer biology could be reproduced. Um, at least for computational work, I think a lot of this is really due to ignoring fundamentals of, of good science. There's, there's a lot of um, kind of fancy hocus pocus tricks and um, a lack of rigor of clearly defining uh, what question we're answering, the you know, falsifiable hypotheses, proper controls, and the like. And people who are really masters in what they do uh, talk a lot about simplicity, how important it is and how, how hard it is. So I think a lot about being simple in our goals, in how we present um, results. Uh, being simple in, in our goals, for example, you know, I, I, think, I, think what we, I think we're trying to cure cancer is our goal. So we want to uh, use big data to predict therapies that are likely to cure cancer advanced technologies that can take those predictions and rapidly test which ones are likely to work and also generate more data that can allow us to make predictions uh, uh, better about new drugs. And we want to bring those to insights to patients quickly. So if we're you know, clear about that this is what drives us, then we can really, I think, coalesce around uh, working together in the most impactful ways. And uh, you know, in terms of how we present results, these are a few examples that I like of you know, a, uh, a, a presentation that you, know, you can describe in 10 seconds what it means and it, you, know, you can kind of get it and we should strive for that. If we are clear about what we want to do, that allows us to, to focus on things that we can really do well, things that can scale, things that can generalize across different applications and things that can really set the foundation of where we want to innovate. Um, Eric Schott, uh, Bing Zhang, and Jun Zhu did this extremely well. They've been you know, working together on this kind of a concept of how you use big data to model networks, identify key drivers, and really driving that concept for the last decade. And the results are amazing. So, you know, Bing bin Zhang, has applied this method across so many different projects in all areas of, of research here. Uh, he's you know, impacted, this is almost like a requisite figure in, in papers uh, nowadays. Um, and you know, this is an example also of you know, if we're working in this kind of a way, everybody wins, right? The science is advanced, but Bin and June and Eric have been extremely successful in their own right, and all the people that they've worked with on these projects have enormously benefited by being able to leverage this foundation of strength that we, that we built up. We can, of course, only um, work, work together like that if we have a, a culture of sharing openly. As, as Ramon said, I spent um, three years of my career at Sage Bionetworks because I thought that you know, how we share and how we work together was literally the most important thing in advancing uh, science at large across the world, and I, I still, still believe that. Uh, we have to be careful about making sure everybody gets proper credit and we don't scoop each other, but we should do that by, by trust, not by uh, you know, building walls, because that will um, uh, slow down our science faster, faster than anything else. So all of these goals, if we are simple, simple on goals, focus on what we can do well, share openly, that you know, is all prerequisites for allowing us to, to synergize, to really take on big, ambitious goals and make progress better than we could do uh, as any of us as, as individuals. And this, this applies um, you know, across our teams working on cancer, but even across other disciplines too at, at Sinai. I, I like this figure made by, made by Alex Charney in the Psychiatric Genetics Group, and they put together a beautiful representation of pretty much the same concept that I'm describing here, and how they built a group of faculty 
who have complementary areas of expertise working in different areas around this circle, and they can work together to really drive this field forward. And again, another example of how, you know, at large they've been extremely successful, and each person working in this group has been extremely successful in their own area of specialty. So we want to um, build uh, this, this kind of a, a culture of, of working together, as Dean Charney said at the beginning, enable you know, each person to make the biggest contribution they possibly can. In order to do that, you know, we really need to um, create a system where each person can you know, go as fast as they want and don't have any barriers, but we also need to do that by being rigorous about rewarding people based on their contributions or scientific contributions, contributions to the team, quality of science, and not other stuff, which we should uh, you know, try to leave, leave on the side. The flip side of, of this, of rewarding contributions, is that we uh, put a big emphasis on delivering. Uh, this, this one thing I like about uh, Mount Sinai is it's very um, performance driven. So, one of the reasons that we're here today talking about what we can do with new bold initiatives is because of the successes uh, that were derived from the last iteration of these initiatives. And we want to you know, take that and go build on it and go even bigger and better and faster in the next round. Uh, and we expect you know, every time we uh, chart a new project, invest in a new project, we need to have a uh, you know, focus on metrics for ensuring that those quickly result in grants, high quality science in order to you know, drive, drive the cycle of science. So these are the things that I personally think about um, a lot and uh, influence the way I, I think about how we want to build, build programs. I think these are the ingredients that allow us to you know, have the kind of impact of making, discovering new treatments much faster than have ever been possible. Specifically, if we align working in this way with the intersection of things that you know, we're most passionate about and we can be the best in the world at. And I've had conversations about this a lot with people here over my first couple of months. And this is another way I got to this kind of a strategy. The things that people here seem to be most passionate about are really innovation and impact. So innovation, new analytics, new cutting edge technologies. We're not happy about you know, just doing something standard and turning the crank again. People really want to push the boundary of you know, how we can make advances in cutting edge analytics technologies and impact. People want their work, their innovations to lead to new discoveries of fundamental mechanisms or therapies that can be translated to patients. And what we, I think, can be the best in the world at, we had a, several, at least in the Icon Institute faculty meetings about this, and what people said was, you know, the theme of integration. Integration because we can move quickly, because we have an integrated health system, and the ability to integrate these strengths in collecting massive data sets, analytic expertise, advanced technologies, and working with disease experts. So I suggest that what we could possibly be the best in the world at and are passionate about is this driving this loop big data to uh, predict new therapies, advanced technologies to get better data and to rapidly test those new therapies and working with disease experts to tell us the right things to focus on and bring those discoveries quickly to patients. And if we go around this circle and each time we learn and get better, then if we keep doing this and keep working together, I think we can discover and deliver breakthrough treatments faster than has ever been possible. So the day-to-day -day is uh, organized around 
learning what great work is going on in all aspects of this um, vision that we want to then bring together into uh, ways to, to work together towards these, these common goals. After the retreat, the, the, the final goals of the retreat is to um, learn about what's going on and then establish these ways of working together, both organically and through new uh, initiatives that I'll be working with uh, Dennis Charney, Ramon Parsons, and many people in this room on uh, taking what we learned today and moving forward on, on building out those, those new initiatives after today. The format, um, we wanted to hear from a lot of people because there's so much great work going on. Um, so we, I think we packed in uh, 35 or 40 talks or something. So we're gonna try to present information really quickly. It's mostly uh, lightning talks and each session has one uh, longer talk. And for those talks, we tried to uh, pick somebody who's uh, newer to to Sinai uh, and maybe haven't, hasn't had their work um, exposed uh, to this, this group uh, as much as, as some others. And each panel, uh, each, each session will be followed by a short panel discussion uh, facilitated by the, the moderator of each session. Uh, please uh, go to this website to provide any, any comments. We want to, we wanted to find ways that are um, a little, perhaps innovative uh, <laughs> rather than standing up, you know, just one person at a time and, you know, collects input from everybody um, who wants to, to give it. So we can record that input, take it back uh, to our planning uh, subsequently. Uh, and input given here will serve as the basis of the discussions that will be uh, moderated by, by the session chair. So they'll look through what's submitted to this platform and pick out themes that they think um, are good to ask, ask to the panel. Um, where is Jennifer and Neha, uh, Dominique? Okay. <laughs> I wanted to acknowledge that they put together this, um, somehow Jennifer programmed this, this, this uh, this input, I don't know how, but they've done an unbelievable job at, at putting this together. So if you see them, thank them today and every day. Uh, and, you know, I'm just going to go off without a hitch for here, but I want to thank them before we get started. Um, <laughs> okay, so the specific sessions are designed to follow um, what we uh, think we can do um, around this, this, uh, this, this circle of, of innovation. The first one, we'll hear about areas that are uh, really leading in big data now, or the biggest data, and that's um, work going on in genetics, uh, epigenetics, genetics, germline, somatic, all areas of, of genetics. Uh, second is a field that really spans all aspects of what we're doing now. Uh, immunology and immunotherapy that, that spans uh, really every box from generating new big data, pushing the boundaries on new technologies, and developing treatments that we can rapidly uh, bring to patients. Uh, third are the um, work in uh, big data analysis, creating data resources and methods to interpret all of these data and bring uh, new therapy, therapeutically relevant insights. And the afternoon sessions will move on to new technologies and go closer to translational applications. So uh, first, uh, new technologies for um, profiling, measuring uh, different aspects of tumor biology that um, you know, haven't been as mainstream to date. And area that I think is maybe the biggest force multiplier uh, that we can focus on uh, in, in this you know, whole innovation cycle is you know, how we rapidly test through functional models, genome technologies, CRISPRs, drug screens, 
the therapeutic relevance of predictions that we that we make. And you know, there's, this is hugely important. I hear this all the time from computational biologists that they could get their work to impact so much faster if they could just integrate with these kind of technologies. We need to work on how we bring immunotherapies into these kind of preclinical models. But you know, the more we can do that, I, I would love to work with people in this room on how we enable that area. And finally, um, people who have started to uh, bring all of this work into clinical translation, which is the end goal, of course. And uh, we're starting to see real amazing advances that suggest that we can do this faster, better than you know, has ever historically been possible. So after today, then we will all work together to determine specifically what, uh, where we want to go with this. We have opportunities to uh, identify new areas to grow in faculty recruitments, new strategic projects, growing our graduate program, building new platforms for organizing data, new technologies for profiling tumors, testing uh, therapies rapidly. And what we have so far intentionally is this. It's at this level. <laughs> That's it. The big concept that we want to drive and then opportunities of how we might build that out. And that's because the rest of the details are not for me. It's for all of us to you know, figure out where we really want to go, what builds on what's currently here, and how we can make it even bigger and better and faster. So that's the work that we have after the retreat. We're going to be talking to a lot of you and working together to put some specifics into all of these categories, figure out how we can really drive this vision of integrating big data, analytics, novel technologies, disease expertise to bring new treatments to discovery into patients faster than has ever been possible. So with that, I'll call up uh, Stephen Burakoff, who's uh, moderating the first session. And I'd like to invite the uh, speakers in the first session also uh, to sit uh, up, on, up on the panel and give your talks and then participate in discussion. Thank you.